Welcome back to another episode of Days and Apologize, the podcast where we help you navigate culture's questions with faith and reason. In today's episode, we're going to look at a question that may not be a super common question that you've gotten, but it is going to be something that uh, keeps people from believing Christianity or even keeps them from considering its claims. And that is about division in the church. So the question is often posed like this. I don't want to become a Christian. Look at all the divisions inside the church. Y'all can't even agree with each other. Why would I want to be a part of that? Um, or they look at the like all the different denominations within the church and they go, look, there's so many different things to believe, so many different ways of going about practicing your faith. <clears throat> like I said, y'all can't even agree. So I don't want to be a part of that. If y'all can't figure it out, it must not be that important or it must not be that easy. And so that's the question we're going to deal with today. And the first thing I think we need to understand is that there is a lot of division in the church. Uh, there are a lot of denominations, and I found this to be shocking. In every place I looked to do research, I found this number <clears throat> was the number that kept popping up. There are over 45,000 denominations uh, of the Christian church globally. I just could not believe that. That blew my mind. And so what I thought would be helpful for the podcast is if we took a deep dive into all 45,000. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Uh, you can keep listening if you haven't already turned it off by now. But, but I do think it's important if we, if we look at the initial divisions or, or we look at kind of the, the big picture things of Christianity. So there are three main branches of Christianity, if you will. Three main arms of belief. And we're going to look at each of these briefly. <clears throat> now, there's a great Gospel Coalition article by Trevin Wax that we're going to um, link, hopefully, to um, this podcast episode. But it's a great, he goes into more detail than I'm going into today, but it's a very, very helpful article. So the first would be Eastern Orthodoxy. So Eastern Orthodoxy was actually birthed out of kind of a controversy over the Nicene Creed. Now, the Nicene Creed was a statement of belief um, for all Christians, and it was adopted by most all the predominant churches in the area, including the Protestant denominations, Roman Catholics, everyone. It was first adopted in the year 325 A.D., but later additions were made to the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is when the kind of the split happened in the 11th century between the Western churches and the Eastern churches. And here was the controversy. Um, there's a part of the Nicene Creed that talks about the Holy Spirit. And if you're not familiar with it, the Nicene Creed starts with, I believe in God the Father, it explains who God is. I believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, it explains who He is. Then it gets to the Holy Spirit. And here's what it says. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified. That phrase, and the Son, is what caused all the controversy. So it says, who proceeds from the Father and the Son? The Eastern churches believed that that was unbiblical and that it was a theological error. And so they, of course, split from the Western churches and kind of that's how Eastern Orthodoxy was born. Now, there's lots of other reasons why they split, why they, why they branched off, but that's kind of the main one. So Eastern Orthodoxy places a high value on liturgical readings, which if you don't know what that is, that's like when the priest would say something and then the congregation would respond. Then the priest would say something, the congregation would respond. That's a liturgical reading. Uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, traditionally, they have bishops who appoint elders, or I mean, they appoint priests, sorry, who then lead and pastor and shepherd the churches. According to Pew Research Center, there are over 260 million Eastern Orthodox worldwide. Second major branch is Roman Catholic. <clears throat> now, the word Catholic just means all or universal. The addition of Roman at the beginning ties it to the Pope, that they, they place him as the supreme authority um, so Roman Catholicism, and they traditionally hold to seven sacraments, or sacraments would be a means of earning grace. That's baptism, confirmation, the Lord's Supper, or Eucharist, penance, uh, anointing of the sick, marriage, and ordination. Catholics believe there's a place for praying to the saints and to Mary, the mother of Jesus. They place a high view on tradition. Um, and in, in, you know, if you've ever been to a Catholic church, you know, they've got st like statues and stained glass windows with apostles and saints all over the place. Those are for veneration, um, respect 
And then they, they traditionally view that the Lord's Supper holds that the bread and the wine, that they change as you partake of them. Uh, they change in substance, not in outward form, but they change in substance to actually be the body and the blood of Christ. Um, so those are some key things about Catholics. According to Pew Research, there's about 1.2 billion Catholics in the world today. The third branch is what is called Protestantism. So Protestantism is from the word protest, which is what happened in the early 1500s. A group of religious leaders began to oppose some beliefs and practice in the Catholic Church. They sought to correct what they thought was error, erroneous teachings, or extra-biblical theological positions that did not align with Scripture. One of the most famous ones is that Catholics believed uh, that you could earn grace um, by paying money to the church, and the priest would then forgive your sin. It's called an indulgence. Um, this is basically a way to have your sin forgiven, uh, but you would pay the church. Um, but a lot of people felt this was in direct contradiction to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Plus, they found out that a lot of these priests were taking this money and padding their pockets with it. So they fought against that. They rebelled against that, which led to the Protestant Reformation. They were seeking to protest corruption, Protestant, and reform the church, Reformation. Um, the, the Reformation can often be summed up in what's called the five solas, which is the Latin word for only or alone. Scripture alone. The Bible is the supreme and final authority, not the Pope, not tradition, or not the church. Christ alone. Sinners are justified in God's sight only on the basis of Christ's finished work on the cross and through the power of the resurrection. Faith alone. God's pardon to sinners is granted to and received by faith alone, not from works. Grace alone. All of salvation from beginning to end is only by the grace of God. And then finally, to the glory of God alone. God alone receives the glory for our salvation. <clears throat> According to Pew Research, there are just over 1 billion Protestants in the world today. Now, I can hear you now. I can hear you. Okay, Pastor Scott, thanks for the history lesson. But what does that really have to do with our episode for today? Well, <clears throat> from these three branches, okay, from these three arms of the Christian faith, you have literally thousands of of other denominations that have branched off of these three. Um, tremendous division of belief and practice. From Eastern Orthodoxy, you've got canonical Eastern Orthodoxy. You've got independent Eastern Orthodox. You've got dozens and dozens of more. I won't go into those details. From the Roman Catholics, who claim to be pre-denominational, they actually have lots of division and separation as well. You have Eastern Catholics who disagree about purgatory and the celibacy of their church leaders. You have independent Catholics who separated from Roman Catholics in 1724 when they began to consecrate, consecrate bishops without the Pope's approval. You can't do that. And then you have independent Catholics. And then from that, you've got, I mean, from the independent Catholics, you've got dozens of smaller branches, um, which even today, there's lots of controversy within the Catholic Church over the Pope's comments on homosexuality, abortion, transgender, and things like that. And then, of course, with Protestantism, you've got hundreds of different denominations, Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Anglicans. And even within those, you've got divisions. Just take the Baptists, for example, Southern Baptists, Independent Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Anabaptist, Fundamental Baptist, Missionary Baptist, Primitive Baptist, United Baptist. So, so, so many divisions. So this is what I'm talking about. This is often where the person, your neighbor, your coworker, your family member, your friend, this is often where they're going to be like, man, what? Come on. You can't even agree on the, on the Baptist side of things or the Lutheran side of things or the Catholic side of things. <clears throat> so what do we do with this? I think one of the first things we have to understand is that there are some good divisions. There are times, we have to understand this, there are times when separation is necessary, when division is needed. So what would those be, you might ask? Well, I, I think biblically, we see division happen, good division uh, or necessary division over doctrinal differences. 
And so differences in belief. Okay, so let's take Acts chapter 17, verses 10 through, uh, to, through 11, for an example. Paul and Silas are in a little town called Berea. It says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word, that's the word, the teaching of the word of God, with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So they were hearing the teaching of Paul and Silas, and they were not just accepting it as right. They were taking what they said, and they were looking in the scriptures to see if it agreed. So what was the deciding factor? See, it wasn't Paul. It wasn't a person. It wasn't tradition. It was the Bible. That was the deciding factor. And the assumption is, if what they read in the scriptures was not in agreement with what Paul and Silas had said, they would have rejected that teaching. There would have been a division. <clears throat> or 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. Uh, Paul warns Timothy against the church accepting false teachers, false gospel. He says, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or things about which they make confident assertions. Again, the X factor is the Bible, its teachings. Are they being true to the Word of God? Are they being true to teach sound doctrine? And I could go on. Romans 16 says the same thing. Watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. So the warning here, right? Watch out for people who cause division, but how does that division come? By teaching something contrary to what is being taught, contrary to the biblical teaching. So the truth of God's word is paramount. That is an okay division. If someone is convictional in their belief that the Word of God is not inerrant, it is not infallible, it is not inspired, it is not authoritative, we're going to have a hard time working together. And that's just a practical truth. We're going to have a hard time working together because I'm going to be holding the Bible up as authoritative and everything we do ought to live according to it. And if, you, if this person doesn't agree with that, they're going to be teaching something that's contrary to that. And I'm going to be saying, no, we got to do what's in here. And they're going to be saying, well, I don't believe that. I don't think that's right. I think this other thing is what we ought to be doing. How do you, how do you work together in that situation? It's very, very difficult. So crucial things, the Bible, what you believe about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the persons of the Trinity, are very crucial that we agree on. If you believe that Jesus was just a great teacher, but not really the Son of God, or that He didn't really rise from the dead, we're going to have a hard time working together. Because again, it goes back to the Bible. The Bible says Jesus is, is the Son of God. And if you don't agree with that, you don't really agree with the Bible. So again, we have the same problem as we did before. However, <clears throat> if someone holds to the belief of Scripture that it is authoritative and inerrant and infallible and inspired and clear and sufficient and necessary, then I do too. Then that's easy to work together. We can work together in unity because we're operating from the same guidebook, from the same handbook. Now, when I was in seminary, a professor gave us a document that was called Theological Triage. If you know triage is like when you go to the, the when you go to the emergency room, you know the nurses and doctors have to triage the patients. What that means is rank them in order of importance. So if I'm coming in with uh, with like a like a like a paper cut, and then someone else walks in and they've accidentally cut their leg, you know, in some construction accident and they're bleeding all over. I mean, that's they're going to triage that and say, okay, the guy with the paper cut can wait. I need to go treat the person with the bleeding leg, right? Well, there's a thing called theological triage. And this is where, what are, tier one, uh, what are tier one issues that we can divide over? Your view of the Bible, your view of God, your view of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, salvation. These are things we can divide over. And it's right and probably good and practical to divide over. But these second and third tier issues are not worth division. 
And so we can't let second and third tier issues divide us. That is an awful testimony to the world. Um, I've told this story before here. <clears throat> um, when I was in the seminary, the first day of class, it was a small class The professors asking us to go around the room and introduce ourselves and what uh, church we work at. And we're going around the room. It's, you know, so-and-so work at First Baptist, so-and-so. So-and-so work at First Baptist, so-and-so. A lot of First Baptists, a lot of normal names. And then, and then this dude raises his hand. He's like, hey, I'm so-and-so. I'm the pastor of Coat Rack Baptist Church. He said, I've been working there, you know, six years. And then they move on to the next guy. Well, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. I raised my hand. I'm like, can we go back to that guy for a second? Because I got to know the story behind that. I said, what's the name of your church? He said, Coat Rack Baptist Church. And I said, there's got to be a story behind that, bro. And he said, yeah. He said, so this happened before I got there, but apparently there was a coat rack, like a rack, like a wooden coat rack that you hang your coats on in the winter. It was donated by this um, sweet little lady in like the 1920s. <clears throat> and um, it was one of those precious kind of heirlooms, uh, icons, if you will, of the church. And uh, for decades, it sat on the stage next to the pulpit. So the pastor's preaching, and there's a coat rack right here beside him. Well, <clears throat> some had voted uh, years before to move the coat rack from the stage where it's in prominent view uh, to the back of the, of the room, kind of in the lobby, in the vestibule area. <clears throat> well, that caused a major stir. People got all up in arms about it. They caused the division. It caused the fight. And it literally led to a church split. So half of the congregation said, we're out of here. We're taking our coat rack and we're going home. But they didn't take it and go home. They took it and moved three miles down the street. And they started another church called Coat Rack Baptist Church. Guys, that is ridiculous, okay? That is obviously not a, 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 a healthy division. That would be a tier, you know, in this document of theological uh, triage, there's only three tiers, but this would be like tier seven. Like it's not something that's worth division. The world looks at that and laughs at us. We need to understand that. When that kind of stuff happens in our churches, we become a laughing stock to the world. They go, why would I want to be a part of that? That is utterly ridiculous. I've had someone say to me, I have so much division and drama in my own life. I don't need to find it in the church also. So when we allow these dumb kind of things to divide us, it is an awful testimony to the church. The Bible calls us to unity. So 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? What he's getting at here is we follow Christ. These small things that divide us, they're ridiculous, and they don't need to divide us. So when you're talking to someone about this, about divisions in the church, and they're using that as a, as a reason why, or maybe it's a legitimate reason why they just don't want to be a part of a church. First thing I think you should do is, to, is, as I've said with other things, empathize with them. You don't like the divisions either, like the story of Coat Rack Baptist Church. Or maybe you've got a story in your own church or your own experience where you experienced an unhealthy division. Tell them that story and say, you know what, I don't like that either. I wish more Christians would get along. Like you can agree with them. You can appreciate their, their issue there. <clears throat> and then I think you need to help them see, second thing you need to do, is that some differences are worth dividing over. Kind of going back to my theological triage. Those first two issues, they are important. And if they don't agree, help them to see that there are things that we need to divide over. For example, take relationships. <clears throat> if you're in a relationship with someone that has, a, that has a very different view of the relationship than you do. For example, let's say you're, you're dating someone. Um, let's say you're a girl and you're dating a guy and he's like, you know, I'm convicted. I believe that it's okay to have a girlfriend while I'm dating you. Or even when I get married one day, I think it's okay to have a girlfriend on the side. What if that's their convictional belief and you don't share that same belief. And if you think that's kind of a crazy example, 
I lived overseas for over for, for about a decade, and this was the common belief of the of the local people that we dealt with. They would often ask me, "Do I have a girlfriend?" And I'm like, "You know my wife. Why are you asking me that?" And they were like, "She's your wife. You can have a local girlfriend. That's okay." They 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 fundamentally believed that that was okay. So you find yourself in that situation. You're dating someone. They fundamentally think that's okay. Now, what are you gonna do? Do you really think it's a good idea to enter into a further relationship with him, to go deeper with him in that relationship? That would be dumb. You're gonna be in conflict from the beginning. And every time you try to deal with it, you're gonna be in conflict. So the wise thing to do would just to be like, say, hey, you know what, we're we're not a good fit. (laughs) We should no longer date. It's not gonna work out from us. We're only gonna be in conflict. That's actually the healthy thing to do for both of you. There's no wisdom in saying, hey, let's power through this when you have a fundamental convictional difference about the nature of your relationship. So if you're talking to someone, help them see that some division is necessary and some division is actually healthy. But then the third thing I think you should do is help them to see that we're not as divided as they might think. Because oftentimes maybe they've just heard about division or maybe they experienced some unhealthy division. So help them see some division is okay but actually, we, we probably get along more than they think we do. So here's just some example. Um, we actually cross-pollinate uh, with other Protestants. They may not know that, but um, think about some men or some people that I've mentioned in this podcast. Thomas Aquinas, St. Francis of Assisi, Augustine. Well, guess what? They were Catholics. They were Catholics. And yet we read them, we have benefited, I have benefited tremendously from books like Augustine's Confessions or St. Thomas Aquinas. He was one of the first apologists. We benefit from them. We can read them and learn a ton from them. And we have read them and learned a ton from them. Or within the Protestant tradition, Anglicans, J.I. Packer, John Stott, N.T. Wright, my personal favorite, someone I've mentioned a lot on, on this podcast, C.S. Lewis. They were Anglicans, <laughs> and yet we agree with them in many ways. We have learned tremendous things from them. How about this? Lutherans, obviously Martin Luther himself, but Philip Melanchthon, maybe you're not as familiar with him, but heavily influential Protestant Reformation. Philip Spainer was a guy that we had to read a lot of his works in seminary, learned a lot from him. And then, of course, our our PCA brethren, the Presbyterian Church in America, we have lots in common with those guys. R.C. Sproul, James Montgomery Boyce, Tim Keller, Kevin DeYoung, all PCA Presbyterian brothers. We have learned a ton from them here at this church. I personally have learned a ton from them. So when you're talking to these folks, maybe help them realize maybe we're not as divided as you think we are. We've made strides in the last few decades of of working together, of understanding that with many of these people, we're joined in the common purpose, right? The Great Commission. And we agree on these first tier issues. And so we have come together to cooperate and to work. And we've gone back in history and looked at people who also held those same convictions. Like I said, like Augustine, Aquinas, St. Francis Francis of Assisi. And we've realized hey, we can learn a lot from these guys. So yes, we reject first tier issues. If we don't agree with those, healthy division, it's actually right and practical to do that. Um, But we also reject fruitless and childish divisions. Things like color of the carpet, choir robes, organ versus piano, what you wear to church, a coat rack next to the pulpit. (laughs) We reject those types of divisions. We strive to obey the commandment Jesus gives in John 13. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So we understand one of our most missional proclamations of the gospel to the world is how we treat one another. And so we strive to be unified where we can. And when we find brothers and sisters that agree with us on first tier issues, we join with them. We link arms and we strive to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. We strive to make disciples of everyone. So I hope this episode has been helpful for you. Thank you for tuning in. God bless.